it is a special lecture and also in the sense that uh, there is a little bit uh, a very little about scaling but uh, however the word scaling will will appear and, and it, it, uh, it plays a uh, plays a role, but uh, you will see. Anyway, uh, the subject is, uh, <coughs> is the foundation of, of thermodynamics. And then this is joint work with Elliot Leap, which we did mostly uh, more than 20 years ago, so you see some references. But uh, I am very happy that it seems to be still in demand and uh, um, people seem to like it, or some do not like it, uh, but uh, anyway, this is a something which uh, is uh, still under discussion. Okay, so let me start with a general praise uh, of thermodynamics by Albert Einstein. And of course you can read it, so I don't really have to read it for you, but the theory is more impressive, the greater the simplicity of its premises, the more different kinds of things it relates, and the more extended it is, uh, it is uh, its uh, the area of applicability. Therefore, the deep impression with classical thermodynamics made upon me. It is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of the applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. Now, <coughs> uh, for the purpose of this talk, I can uh, summarize the, uh, uh, the core of thermodynamics in uh, uh, the following statement. We want to understand a basic empirical fact. I see that uh, here on the screen you don't show uh, the uh, uh, one half of the screen which is, uh, uh, which is uh, not completely visible on the screen, but a little bit, little bit, but here you don't see anything of that. Okay, well, we will have to live with that. Anyway, so uh, <coughs> the, uh, the basic uh, task of thermodynamics is to understand uh, and separate uh, the possible from the impossible in a quantitative way. One of the first things I will have to do is to define precisely operationally uh, what I mean by uh, this first phrase under adiabatic conditions. And maybe uh, a little note is that uh, for <coughs> macroscopic systems, their scaling limits, so to say, come into play, uh, this, dis this distinction between uh, the possible and the impossible is unambiguous. For smaller system probability might come into play and will come into play, but that is not our concern here. So if you will, we are talking about systems in their scaling limits, mostly. Uh, it, well, we will in the end uh, talk about something a little bit uh, more general. Now here is my operational definition of the, uh, uh, the definition of the concept of possible under adiabatic conditions. I say that the state, why, I, I will denote states of uh, my system. Uh, by uh, capital letters, and the state y is adiabatically accessible from a state x, and I write it in this way. So this is the basic relation that will play a uh, much role here. So uh, I think it's quite suggestive. It means that to say the things get more uh, chaotic when you when you go from the left to the right. Uh, but we will uh, also, when I have to talk about the relation, I sometimes say that, uh, uh, that x precedes y. And the operational de definition is that it's possible to change the state x to the state y in such a way that the only net effect on the surrounding is that the weight may have risen or fallen. Of course, this weight is just a, an example of a source and sink of mechanical energy. In a spacecraft, you would maybe use a spring or a flywheel or whatever. Anyway, um, the important uh, point, which I was to stress here, is that uh, these processes do not ha have to be gentle in uh, Anyway, they can be, it can be arbitrarily violent. This is important to stress this because the word adiabatic is uh, uh, um, so well, sometimes, and in fact uh, often in, in physics, used for something slow in time. That is not what is meant here. 
the operational definition is exactly what, uh, what is written there. Now the second law of thermodynamics <coughs> says uh, that uh, for equilibrium states of macroscopic systems at least, uh, one can characterize this relation adiabatic accessibility by the increase or rather non-decrease of an essentially unique state function which is called uh, entropy and denoted by S which is extensive and, uh, and, and also additive on subsystems. Historical note, this word uh, entropy was uh, coined by Rudolf Clausius in the mid 19th century uh, from what he had <coughs> been calling the transformational content of a body. So already there he was thinking of some transformations. Now here is a caricature of this which is from a popular version of our paper which appeared in Physics Today in two, year 2000. This is a drawing uh, done by, by my daughter then uh, for, for uh, 20 years. She was around 15 I guess. Anyway, so here is a, here is a state X which is being uh, transformed adiabatically into a state Y. And this uh, is, uh, so the source of, of work here is this weight. Which, and, but there may also be a machinery and there may also be a clever uh, intelligent being like a gorilla because gorillas can be quite clever and uh, the gorilla is doing its best to, uh, uh, to work on the system. It may uh, use part of this machinery uh, to help it but in the end the gorilla is in the same state as before. To be exactly in the same state you might have to feed it with a couple of bananas to compensate, but uh, well, but anyway, this gorilla is also, also, also the model to stress that these uh, transformations do not have to be gentle. Uh, why gorilla? Well, it so happened that when we were writing our paper, there were commercials on American TV uh, <coughs> for uh, indestructible luggage, Samsonite, I think, and there was a gorilla jumping up and down on a suitcase and uh, on the conveyor belt, so that is the source of this. Anyway, <coughs> now the, um, the uniqueness uh, of entropy is very important because it means that all methods of defining entropy for equilibrium states lead to the same results, provided the basic re requirements that the entropy characterizes adiabatic accessibility and is, is additive and extensive is fulfilled. In particular, uh, the famous Boltzmann formula, uh, well, if one could prove that it really does what, what is required of entropy, then it's the same. Uh, there is always the same entropy. For equilibrium states, I must uh, certainly emphasize this, this is not some, uh, some so to say, idiosyncratic uh, entropy we are defining here. If uh, you, you by some means have a function which does what, what it is intended to do, and it's always the same. It's a little bit like the story of the, <coughs> of the blind man and the elephant. You may remember this, uh, uh, that um, the blind men, <coughs> they are <coughs> investigating an elephant. And, and one of them, he uh, pats it on the side, another one, he uh, investigates the trunk and the other, the tail maybe. And uh, <coughs> so they have different ways of uh, uh, of uh, researching the elephant, which is always the same elephant. It's like that with the, with the entropy. This uniqueness ensures that. Anyway, the, uh, the additivity and extensivity are uh, likewise very essential. First, they, they, they guarantee the essential uniqueness. And secondly, they simplified greatly the experimental and theoretical determination of entropy. For instance, in order to predict the, the efficiency of a geothermal power plant, let's say, it suffices to know the properties of a one kilogram of water, which you can find in, in so-called steam tables, which I uh, worked with quite a lot when I was teaching mechanical <coughs> engineering students. That's great fun. Usually physicists, they don't learn about that. They just learn about ideal gases, but uh, there's also real <laughs> real stuff out there. Now the main me message of the talk is that there is a simple 
and uh, direct approach to the existence and uniqueness of, of uh, entropy for thermodynamical equilibrium states of macroscopic systems based only on properties of the relation of adiabatic accessibility. In particular, neither heat, uh, temperature, thermal reservoirs, nor assumptions about the microscopic structure of matter, statistical mechanics or probability, are needed for the definition of entropy. These uh, macroscopic models may, of course, and will be extremely important in determining the entropy for specific systems, but for the, for the definition of the concept, they are not needed, and that is the message here of the talk. Now the required properties, they are necessary and sufficient for the existence of entropy and they are very plausible except one, which is the adiabatic comparability of state. I will make that precise in a minute. <coughs> now, um, in the case of equilibrium states, this comparability can be derived from some further physical assumptions. But this requires substantially more work mathematically. In fact, there is a simple part of our paper and there is a much more complicated part than what I am talking about today. And in fact, in most of the cases when I am talking about this, I am only talking about the simple part, just as a side remark. For non-equilibrium states, on the other hand, and we really seriously only started to think about that uh, not so long ago, uh, but the conclusion was that, uh, uh, that, uh, that there is an entropy characterizing the relation exists if and only if comparability holds. And to prove this in the non-equilibrium situation is, is uh, much more difficult and even uh, even impossible in our opinion in general because this, uh, this uh, holds if and only if every state is adiabatically equivalent to an e equilibrium state <coughs> which is uh, highly implausible if you are far from equilibrium. <coughs> now, uh, yes? And adiabatically equivalent is now not the physics intuition, but the... Uh, well, there is this uh, equivalent, yeah, well, uh, I will make this uh, precise a list of these concepts which I have been using uh, um, uh, so far. Uh, equivalent as a high, uh, that means that uh, you can go from, uh, those two states are adiabatically equivalent if you can, if you can go from x to y and you can go from y to x, then they are equivalent. In now the lack of comparability can uh, also lead to non-uniqueness if we look at the entropy for non-scalable uh, mesoscopic systems. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, there you can, uh, in fact, uh, here, here uh, it says extremal entropy, it should be extensive. Uh, entropy, they can be, di be defined by means of entropy meters. That's a minor thing which I will mention at the end if I have time for it. Now here are uh, the main references on this. There is this basic paper uh, from 99. <coughs> uh, it con contains also a, a, a long historical introduction so where from which you will uh, see that this way of thinking about entropy, which is uh, very different from what you do usually in textbook books, is uh, has uh, many uh, precursors and uh, uh, there are many names one could mention um, going back to uh, Landsberg, Falk and Young, Buchdahl, uh, Robin Giles, etc. etc. There is a long historical in introduction in this paper, but I'm not going to uh, detail that. Now, here is this uh, uh, popularized version in Physics Today from which this picture was taken. And then, uh, finally, there are two papers uh, uh, published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, 2013 and 2014, where we uh, present some thoughts on non-equilibrium entropy and also uh, entropy of non-extensive systems. So these are the references here, main, my main references. There are also other, uh, uh, other versions of this in, in various proceedings. Now the basic concepts now uh, for equilibrium thermodynamics 
uh, I'm going to list them and then there come the axioms. And uh, uh, so uh, listing them means that I'm simply giving them names and uh, you have to have some uh, intuition what they mean. But this uh, is also to say an axiomatic approach which has uh, similarities with axiomatic approach to geometry. Uh, we have here symbols, we give them names and there are some rules how to <coughs> how to handle these uh, symbols in, uh, in uh, mathematical arguments. But uh, uh, the symbols, uh, it's like a, like, like a Hilbert, he said when I was talking about axiomatization of geometry, when we have the Euclidean axioms, they are true uh, however you in interpret these uh, symbols. I mean, you could say a point is a is a table and uh, a line is a chair or whatever, if, if the rules of uh, how these uh, concepts are conne connected are fulfilled, then, then that's all right. So it is in this uh, sense that, uh, uh, that uh, these uh, uh, symbols and the operations with them are uh, to be understood. So to say the rules of, of uh, uh, working with them, that is what really defines them for the practical purpose and you have of course some uh, intuition what you mean by it by the thermodynamic system that is a lump of, of matter maybe in some container or, or, or whatever and they can be simple <coughs> that is a t uh, uh, technical uh, concept uh, where, which uh, I will mention a, a little bit more detail later or compound. Compound means that I have here many uh, lumps of systems. I am also able to, to cut them in half or even in uh, one fourth or three fourth or, 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 or take uh, some, uh, some arbitrary fraction of them and put these uh, pieces here side by side on my table. And so then I have uh, uh, different state spaces. <coughs> and, uh, but uh, when I look at some uh, uh, such uh, systems together, then I, I simply use this uh, notation of a Cartesian product and, uh, and pairs or, or tipples. Uh, this is just for, for pairs. <coughs> then there is a, the, uh, the concept of a scaled copy, which intuitively simply means if I take one liter of water here and uh, now I take uh, two liters of water at the same temperature and pressure, then that would be scaling by two, and I can scale it uh, by an arbitrary uh, real parameter. And uh, the corresponding state spaces are then denoted by scaling parameter times the, uh, the state uh, space. Uh, in concrete uh, realization of the state spaces as uh, subsets of Rn, this of course will have a definite meaning. But here it is just like with this, uh, with this abstract axiomatization of geometry that uh, the, these symbols and the operations acquire meaning uh, through the axioms. Now come the conditions on this relation. And these are in fact all uh, completely obvious if you think of this. Uh, this interpretation which I had given to it. You remember a, a, a relation means x uh, uh, precedes y with respect to re this relation if I can go from x to y by means of some gorilla machinery and the weight and uh, leave everything else unchanged. So there is transitivity. There is consistency if I can, if I have a system consists of two parts and if I can do something with this and something with that, then I have uh, done something with the uh, compound system. Now then here is a very important is scaling invariance. Namely, I assume that if I can do something with uh, a one kilo here and, uh, uh, and one kilo here, and then I can uh, do the same with, uh, with uh, half a kilo in the same uh, internal state, so to say, or, or, or scaling by, by, an, uh, by an arbitrary parameter. So the scaling invariance is, is important. That's what comes in here and uh, really makes the formulas in which we, in the end, uh, write down rather uh, simple. <coughs> The splitting and recombination, if I have some lump of matter here, I split it, lambda, one over lambda, uh, take uh, these parts apart, 
and look at them as a compound system. Uh, that is an adiabatic operation and uh, I can also put them together again and that is again adiabatic so the splitting from that splitting point of view so it's a pair lambda minus uh, 1 minus lambda x times uh, uh, lambda x is equal adiabatically equivalent to x and finally there is a, a certain stability requirement which uh, replaces all considerations of topology. So this says that if I can uh, transform a state x to a state y with the help of some arbitrary small amount of uh, other system, then I might just well as say that uh, I can go from x to y. This would, uh, one could do away with this by simply uh, defining the relation in this way, but uh, this is uh, so to say what uh, replaces any uh, topological considerations as long as we are not uh, introducing concrete state spaces for these systems. Here are some of the notations I have already used. Namely, um, <coughs> I say that uh, uh, two states are comparable if uh, I can go either from x to y or from y to x, then they are comparable. So uh, uh, an example of states which are certainly not comparable is one kilo of gold and one kilo of lead, for instance. Also not half a kilo of water and two kilos of, of, of water, they are not comparable. <coughs> now they are adi adiabatically equivalent if uh, both conditions hold. And if I can go uh, one way but not back, then I say that x strongly precedes y and write it like this. And here also some uh, notation because this uh, appears now in the statement of the second law. I say that um, a compound state uh, consisting here of lambda x1, x1, so lambda x1, uh, with, uh, I compare it with, with, uh, <coughs> with a state like that, and these are in the same state space, I say that they, they ha have the same mass if the sums of these coefficients are the same. This is just a notation in order to be able to state the second law in a neat way. <coughs> now, <coughs> these conditions, A1 to A6, I hope you agree with me that they are all very plausible if you interpret this uh, relation in the way I have, I have done, and they are clearly, clearly necessary. <coughs> However, they are not sufficient for the existence of an entropy that characterizes the relation on compound systems, made of scaled copies of gamma. A further uh, property is needed, and that's what we call the comparability property. And uh, we could, of course, uh, uh, formulated in a more uh, uh, general or stringent way, but this is uh, sufficient for the purpose of this lecture. <coughs> the uh, condition is that any two states, is 1 minus lambda gamma uh, cross uh, lambda gamma, are comparable for all lambdas between 0 and 1. So if I take uh, this part of the system, I take the system, I split it, and then I do something here and I, I do something there. That's comparable with, uh, with any other state which I have done, uh, obtained in the same way, uh, uh, possibly with a different lambda. Now, <coughs> now comes here uh, um, the following statement. And uh, yeah, let me see, didn't I? Yeah, well, I, I had stated here before, uh, so to say, the, yeah, this, uh, the second law uh, here, so to say, comes again, the second law, but now in a more formal setting, namely <coughs> as the theorem. <coughs> I'm sort of say proving uh, the second law in this uh, uh, form which I had stated it. The following are unique, uh, are the following uh, conditions are equivalent. First, the relation satisfies these assumptions A1 to A6, which are obvious, and the comparison property. Secondly, there is an there is an additive and extensive uh, function defined on all compounds of scale copied of gamma, such that whenever x and y have the same mass, then x precedes y if and only if the entropy of x is less than or equal to the entropy of y. And the function is unique, 
up to an affine change of scale. I can change uh, a multiplicative constant and I can also change by an, by an additive constant. <coughs> Now here I can even prove this or, or give a sketch of the proof. This is not very deep mathematics. <coughs> we pick two reference points and let now x uh, be an, uh, an arbitrary state which lies between them. Uh, I can do this more generally than I have simply to shift these, these points. Uh, well, if I have an entropy function, <coughs> then we know because this strongly precedes here that this must be strictly less than uh, S x y. <coughs> and uh, so uh, also uh, because of this uh, condition here, they must be ordered, these numbers must be ordered in this way. And this means that there is a unique lambda between 0 and 1 so that I can write this number as a combination of these numbers here. <coughs> now. But by the required properties of entropy, this is equivalent to x being equivalent uh, to the, this combination here. And uh, if I have another entropy function, <coughs> then uh, we also have this, but, but uh, now with, with this replaced by, by some lambda prime. But from the assumptions a1 to a6, it follows that this can only hold for at most one lambda, that is to say, lambda must be equal to lambda prime. This is the <coughs> proof of uh, uniqueness. Now the proof of the existence is also not very complicated. <coughs> now uh, from the uh, <coughs> assumptions and the comparison uh, property, we conclude that uh, if x0, x and x1 stand in the uh, relation stated there, then the following two numbers are equal, namely uh, the supremum of uh, uh, this uh, uh, 1 minus la lambda x uh, lambdas, so that I can go from 1 minus lambda x0, lambda x1 to, uh, to x, and uh, the infimum with uh, the relation the other way around. Now, moreover, if uh, this uh, soup and the infimum are at attained, then, uh, then uh, these numbers must coincide. And I, I do have this relation. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, so therefore, uh, I can uh, conclude what I, uh, what I namely proved. I, I, uh, this lambda x will uh, be, the, be the entropy of x uh, with respect to these reference points, x0 and x1. Uh, but note that the comparability of all states in this uh, 1 minus lambda gamma, lambda gamma, not only those in gamma, are essential for this. <coughs> now we can choose, uh, if you like, uh, uh, the entropy of one of these uh, reference points as 0 and the other equal to 1. And then we have this explicit formula for the entropy. So S of x is the supremum of all numbers lambda prime so that I can go from 1 minus lambda prime x0 lambda x1 to x and it's the same as the infimum for the relation the other way around. And this uh, formula for the entropy you see that it uses only this relation, nothing else. It's a sort of an interpolation between these two numbers, uh, uh, the entropy of uh, uh, x0, which I by definition can take equal to 0, and the uh, x1, I take it be that. These are the, so to say, determines these two free parameters which I have, but here is an explicit formula. And any other choice of x0 or of, or of this, I, I don't necessarily have to have here 0 and 1, I could have here some uh, little a and some little b, but that simply leads to a shift of, of uh, of this function here by an, by an additive constant and the multiplicative constant. And this is shown here schematically a little bit. Here is the x, which I want to define the entropy for. Here are these uh, uh, reference points. And I am considering a process which goes from here with a 1 minus lambda to that, and, and this back, and this. And this sx is the supremum 
of uh, all the lambda primes for which, which this is possible, and that's the same as the infimum for all the lambda double prime for this. This is possible. <coughs> now you can uh, imagine that this is not a very deep theorem, but uh, it's uh, not completely obvious, and uh, and it's uh, yeah and. Uh, the proof really uses all these axioms, which we had, had written down. Uh, now here is a, a also a caricature of this. I think I will maybe skip that. Well, I'm here uh, determining the entropy of one kilogram of, of water. Here is the machinery. The gorilla is missing, but it could be here around. And now I compare this. Here are the uh, uh, fixed state. I simply say here steam and water, uh, steam and ice. Uh, there need not be any phase transition involved here, of course. This is just some references uh, here. And, uh, and the ice, these are the two, uh, two uh, reference states. And if this is possible, then I'd simply uh, look at this lambda. There's a unique lambda for which this uh, picture here is possible, and that is the entropy of this kilogram of water here now. Now, the special role of this uh, comparison property uh, is, uh, which is, is not at all obvious, although, uh, well, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, <coughs> There is a, a quite some literature on uh, or, or precursors of, of this work. I mentioned some names. I mentioned Falk and Young, Landsberg, uh, Buchdahl, uh, Giles, uh, which have similar ideas. None of them really has the scaling as we have, but they have also a, a, a relation of this kind. But all these works, they assume uh, that this comparison property holds, they simply take that as, uh, uh, take that, uh, uh, as an uh, uh, axiom without any further justification. Now, we were not content with that. And uh, in fact, uh, so we started really on this by, by, by looking at comparison uh, before we, uh, we did what I have been saying <laughs> until now. And now I can just tell you that this uh, comparison property can be derived from additional assumptions about what we call simple systems. Simple systems are uh, simple uh, are systems. Now we are, for the first uh, time, introducing coordinates. Until now, this has been all completely abstract. But now we want to introduce coordinates. There is a coordinate, a natural physical coordinate, which is the energy. Uh, the, what is behind that is the first law of thermodynamics, of course. And there are some one or more work coordinates. Could be vo volume, could be uh, uh, magnetic fields. Uh, there could be many uh, work coordinates. If I have uh, many systems coupled and I have, have, uh, can change the volume of each of them individually. Well, anyway, <coughs> there you have uh, your state space, which until now is a completely abstract set now uh, becomes a subset of, of some r uh, n plus 1, where this 1 is the uh, dimension of the, of the energy coordinate. It's important that, the, that there is only one energy coordinate, but there can be more uh, work coordinates. <coughs> and uh, at the same time, so we derived this comparison property from assumptions about such uh, systems. At the same time, we establish the contact with traditional concepts like temperature and pressure. And uh, the assumptions for simple systems uh, are, are here. We assume that we can do con converse combinations in this uh, uh, concrete state space, that this is, a, a, this is an adiabatic operation. Uh, there is a continuity a, a assumption about the pressure, where the pressure is defined as the slope of the boundary of uh, the states which I can reach adiabatically from some given state. <coughs> <coughs> now, well, we, we assume, in fact, some Lipschitz continuity of this, uh, this uh, function. And then the existence of at least one irreversible state change, uh, starting from any given state. And also, and this is a, <coughs> also uh, 
uh, to get connection with really thermodynamics, we need something like the zeroth law of thermodynamics. We will need to talk about uh, thermal uh, links between systems. This is, a, 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 this is an operation <coughs> where we have, let's say, two systems. The one has uh, one has an energy coordinate u1, another an, an energy coordinate uh, u2. Then we make a, a link by uh, simply bringing them in contact with by a copper thread or, or something which or a silver thread, something which conducts uh, heat uh, uh, well. And then, uh, lo and behold, after a while, the energies they have split up in a definite way. And the systems have, uh, in standard parlance, they have now, uh, are now in thermal equilibrium with each other. <coughs> and by, by in this way, we can start from two simple systems and we can make one simple system by such thermal links. And uh, by, uh, by uh, stating, uh, stating an axiom about such uh, operations, we can, for instance, exclude bad situations like here. Now, this uh, is a, a picture of some state space uh, with coordinates u and some work co coordinates v. The state space is a convex uh, subset of this uh, r n plus 1. And what I draw here are some states x, y, z. And this, uh, these lines here are what is in common parlance called uh, the adiabats. Namely, these are the boundaries of uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, sets uh, which are adiabatically accessible from the given state. For instance, this x here, if you start with that, then everything above it is adiabatically accessible, likewise here, uh, likewise here. This is, so to say, the good situation which uh, prevails. But a priori, if you don't put uh, any further assumption in, you could have crazy situations like this. And uh, one must do something to exclude that. And that's what we can do with very plausible assumptions. <coughs> now, uh, these assumptions, they allow also uh, the, de the derivation of the comparison uh, property, but moreover, <coughs> they also show that the, the entropy is a once differentiable function of the energy and the work coordinates, and that the temperature, which is now defined by this famous formula here, it characterizes the equilibrium at thermal contact between different systems. And from this point of view, temperature is an afterward rather than a forward for the foundations of thermodynamics. Usually, or, or very often, you start with the zero law of thermodynamics, and uh, that is the reason it has this uh, low number. And so to say temperature, or rather empirical temperature, is then something which uh, characterizes uh, the thermal equilibrium. And that is the beginning of the story. Here, it's completely the other way around. Temperature comes in only at the very end. <coughs> Now, uh, a few remarks more on, on, uh, on uh, uh, this connection with uh, standard thermodynamics. <coughs> One con consequence of the existence of entropy is a formula, which uh, is very one of my favorite formula. It is due to Max Planck already in the early 20th century, and uh, it allows one to uh, relate relate an uh, arbitrary empirical temperature scale to the absolute temperature scale, T. Well, usually in, in first courses in thermodynamics, you define uh, 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 the absolute temperature by the efficiency of Carnot machines. But imagine you wanted to do some low temperature physics, and you had to always to bring in uh, a pair of uh, or bring in Carnot machines and look at their efficiency to measure the temperature. Of course, you never do that. You measure it by completely <laughs> different ways. But in order to be able to use the basic formulas of thermodynamics, you have to be able to uh, compute the absolute temperatures. <coughs> and that is uh, done here uh, by Max Planck with this uh, beautiful formula which tells you you have to uh, simply you have to have some empirical uh, temperature scale uh, and th then you have to know some material coefficients 
uh, expansion coefficients and uh, uh, pressure coefficients here, and then you have this formula. This formula is derived from the fact that, uh, uh, the, that the entropy <coughs> is a state function, so it has a uh, uh, ds is a total differential, and uh, a total differential has special properties. And from the integrability uh, condition, you derive a differential equation for the temperature as a function of this empirical scale. Uh, uh, also, uh, when once you have derived this, uh, what is often called the fundamental equation of thermodynamics, uh, and I, I wrote it here also even with chemical potentials. I have not said anything about that yet, but you will be f f uh, familiar with this from your thermodynamic uh, course. Once you uh, know this formula here, and you know that this is a total differential, you can derive, and this is usually done in courses uh, in thermodynamics as, as exercises for students, but you, you derive a very remarkable formula which uh, link quantities which you measure by completely different means and there is no entropy in this uh, formula here. The entropy is so to say sitting in the background and dictating what you can do. Here is for instance the, uh, this is for dilute gases, uh, well ideal gases, that the velocity of sound is related to the heat capacities. So what, what on earth should velocity of sound have to do with heat capacities? I mean, it's, a, it's a mystery except that when you know that it follows for simply from the differentiability or, or from the fact that this is a total differential, then you can derive this fairly easily. Here is a clausius clapeyron equation. I'm not going to repeat what these symbols mean. This is the heat of, of uh, uh, the latent heat, and this is the uh, change in volume. And here is a, an equation, Toft equation from chemical thermodynamics, the equilibrium constant here the temperature dependence on the equilibrium constant linked to the to the heat of reaction. <coughs> okay, so I'm not doing that badly. Well, also I'm going to see if I, how much I can say about the non-equilibrium thi things. Now there is an, yet another, namely uh, that you, uh, by using entropy, you can uh, say something about maximal work that you can obtain from a system. There is a concept for that which physicists usually don't learn about. It's called exergy uh, or availability. It looks a little bit like free energy, but it's not the same because the temperature here is the, is the temperature of the environment and not of that of the system. So, <coughs> now, okay, so this is all what I have to say about equilibrium thermodynamics, and now I have how much time? Well, I have almost 15 minutes. Of course, I had to go very fast. I don't know how easy it was to follow this. But uh, so let me say something about non-equilibrium states. First general remark, <coughs> there exist very many variants of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, so there's a classical irreversible thermodynamics, which <coughs> is, uh, deals with situation close to equilibrium. There is uh, extended irreversible thermodynamics, so rational thermodynamics, and uh, many other formalisms. Now, most formalisms, they consider only states close to the equilibrium or stationary non-equilibrium states. That's uh, one point here to note. Uh, another point to note is that the role of entropy is much less prominent than in equilibrium thermodynamics. In equilibrium thermo thermodynamics, uh, the entropy really determines everything that you like to know or want to know ab about the system and uh, all its uh, thermodynamic properties. There are, is much more, of course, in uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. There are also flow equations and. and all sorts of phenomena and, and a single, uh, single function like the entropy uh, does not have uh, the same power as, as in equilibrium situations. Now, <coughs> what we have to say about non-equilibrium entropy is the following. We consider a system with a state space gamma of equilibrium states and uh, uh, Imagine that this is a subset of some larger 
st space of non-equilibrium states. Now, while uh, this gamma is of generally a finite dimensional space with work coordinates and energy coordinates, the uh, non-equilibrium states cannot be simply be characterized by uh, such simple parameters. But, uh, but, but, well, but anyway, we assume that the relation Brec uh, of adiabatic accessibility is defined on this extended space with the same operational uh, interpretation as before, and that uh, the, the restriction to gamma is characterized by an entropy function as discussed uh, previously in the equilibrium situations. Now, the basic question we ask, a natural question, what are the possible extensions of the entropy from the equilibrium space uh, gamma to the non-equilibrium states? Uh, now we have to make some assumptions, and here are uh, assumptions. <coughs> well, first of all, it should satisfy the assumption A1, uh, reflexivity, transitivity, consistency, stability, but the scaling, <coughs> scaling assumption and the splitting uh, assumption, they are only required for the equilibrium state. It's not natural to do that for the general non-equilibrium states. Now, here is a uh, very important uh, assumption. Namely, we assume that every non-equilibrium state lies between two equilibrium states in the sense that I can generate uh, any non-equilibrium state I am interested in, starting with an equilibrium state and likewise, well, if I wait long enough, then this will relax to an uh, equilibrium state. Maybe it needs some uh, help by some machinery, but anyway, as I assume this relation here. Now, uh, if I know this, I can define two entropies, one S minus and S plus by a sup and inf. A little bit like before, except that there is no scaling parameter lambda. And now there are some uh, rather uh, simple uh, properties which uh, follows from the axioms. Uh, they are both uh, uh, monotone with respect to, to this relation. Uh, and any other function on, on uh, the, uh, <coughs> the non-equilibrium state that has these properties lies between S minus and S plus. So this delimits the possible non-equilibrium entropies. Now, uh, S minus is super additive and S plus is uh, sub additive at least. Uh, it, well, it's, uh, it will only be additive if they coincide. And here is a, a picture, of course, to uh, illustrate this. Here is the non equilibrium state, and here is the non equilibrium uh, state space. And uh, here are these uh, states. Uh, here, I can, uh, here is the equilibrium state space. And, uh, S minus is this uh, supremum of uh, all the entropies here from which I can go to this space and likewise here this is the infimum for all the entropies which uh, it goes the other way around. <coughs> now <coughs> the role of comparability we can discuss that namely the following is equivalent that uh, these two entropies S plus and minus that they coincide that there is a unique uh, uh, S prime uh, which extends the equilibrium entropy such that uh, X uh, precedes Y implies uh, that S uh, hat X is less than S uh, hat Y. Now there exists a unique uh, uh, S hat extending S such that uh, if I have the relation for the entropies then I have the rela relation for the states. And, uh, Finally, that every x, non-equilibrium state x, is comparable to every y in uh, every y, that the comparability property holds on x uh, hat, and since gamma is, is, is part of, uh, namely equilibrium states, is part of the non-equilibrium states, this means that every x, non-equilibrium state, is adiabatically equivalent to some, some z uh, equilibrium states. And this, uh, this last uh, condition is, of course, uh, highly uh, implausible that this holds in general. So the, uh, except in some approximate way if you are sufficiently close to equilibrium. So the conclusion 
from this, as we, we see it, is that <coughs> there is, in general, no unique uh, uh, non-equilibrium entropy. You have to live with this non-uniqueness. Last thing, uh, generalization two, non-extensive entropies. If we uh, uh, the scaling assumption, even if we only consider equilibrium states, the scaling assumption is not always natural. If you have systems with long-range forces, where surface effects are important, or mesoscopic systems. So the entropy for such systems, however, it can be defined, again by such inf formulae, by using a normal system for which I know the entropy as an entropy meter. I define uh, the entropy by by uh, simply coupling the two systems and defining uh, <coughs> the entropy as, uh, well, in fact, the two entropies, S minus and S plus, again. And if I have, <coughs> uh, well, I, here I must also make an assumption, uh, similar to that for the non-equilibrium entropies, that I, these functions are well defined. And I have also here a uh, uh, similar formula that uh, uh, that, uh, that both functions are monotone with respect to relation and that every other function that has a property lies between and whether it's super additive and uh, other subadditive. And if we have comparability, then we have that both uh, entropies coincide and I have the entropy uh, principle, the second law in the same form as before. Also, I have that the S is, uh, is uh, additive. And this is uh, uniquely determined by these uh, properties up to an additive constant. Okay, now I am coming to an end. I think this is maybe five minutes longer than I had intended, but I am now about to finish. So uh, I want to summarize. <coughs> we have shown that an essentially unique entropy characterizing the relations of adiabatic accessibility among equilibrium state can be derived from very natural assumptions and the comparability property. Now, comparability cannot be expected to hold for arbitrary non-equilibrium states. However, one can uh, delimit the range of possible adiabatic state changes by means of two well-defined uh, non-equilibrium entropy functions, and comparability holds if and only if the two functions coincide. Likewise, for non-scalable systems, the mathematical reasoning behind all this <coughs> is, uh, is, uh, is uh, so to say, de uh, depends only on a few axioms and is, is, it is uh, independent of a speci specific concrete realizations or interpretation of the state concept and the relation. And therefore the conclusions hold whenever the assumptions are fulfilled. And the, fra uh, the framework is applicable in uh, other contexts, for instance, in uh, quantum information theory, where this has been. So with this uh, last remark, I think it resonates uh, well with the quote I uh, brought at the beginning of uh, Einstein's, where he said that the theory is more impressive, the greater the simplicity of its premises and the more different kinds of things it relates and the more extended its area of applicability. So here are some uh, recent examples of uh, papers where uh, such uh, where a relation of this kind and, and uh, even uh, some of our axioms have been adopted. Uh, in particular here a paper by <coughs> Renato Renner and co-workers, axiomatic relation between thermodynamics and information theoretic entropies. And here is a very new paper with uh, in the framework of uh, general resource theories where uh, our uh, uh, framework, so to say, appears as, as one example up among many. And uh, <coughs> after this, I can now just thank you for your attention. <coughs> Any questions, comments, remarks? So it's it's a very I almost don't dare to ask this question because it's sort of technical. I was wondering all the time what your uh, 
how what, what structure these axioms impose on your state space because you it's a little bit different than the usual intuition one has when I regard the system and I, I put two systems together then in your in your theory this is on the Cartesian product since I can repeat this the <coughs> state must contain arbitrary Cartesian product so it will get extremely large well, I can make such uh, states, of course, yeah. Yes, but, but uh, I'm just wondering about the description. Usually when you have a set of states, <coughs> you would like to characterize this set. Well, Is there a well, characterization in this? In this? Yeah, well, uh, a large part of uh, what I said then is <coughs> is completely independent of any concrete realizations. But then I jump to these simple systems, which I mentioned, where the state space is concretely uh, uh, even either R uh, n plus 1 or a convex uh, subset of that. And there it is very important for the analysis to have this convex structure. Of course, but in, 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 I mean, the concrete system is clear, but I was just wondering about the abstract uh, framework. Yeah, the abstract framework is, is just what it is. <laughs> yeah, it, it is what it is, but the question is, what, what can you say anything about how large the state space is? I mean, usually you have a state space, as you say, some, some convex subset of a, a set of fixed dimension, but even when you put two systems together, you're taking mm -hmm. a Cartesian product and already doubling the dimension. Yes, yes. And so so it is a, it's a very large space in your... In your uh, uh yes, well, uh, sometimes in, in this state uh, where I am uh, talking about uh, <coughs> the simple systems, when I connect them, make a thermal contact that of course reduces the number again but in the in the abstract setting it can be uh, this can be arbitrary finite finite products but that uh, uh, doesn't do any harm in fact there is there is one uh, theorem which i of course did not uh, discuss here is when you want to calibrate uh, these constants entropy constants for different systems uh, there you might have to t make resource if you have an arbitrary many uh, to something like uh, so to say abstract uh, Hamel basis uh, things like that but that's uh, I think as abstract nonsense you should just think about that you have a finite collection of systems but you can make of course as many copies of them as you like and that uh, doesn't change anything. <coughs> okay. Any other question or comment? Yeah. So <coughs> I was confused about this uniqueness proof. Maybe I didn't understand the notation you had there when you, when you it was rather early. Yeah, well, that's. Uh, that was very early. I mean, this. Uh, yeah, here is, uh, here is uniqueness, yeah? And there, there you proved. It, it, uh, there you had once the, uh, uh, the, the argument that this, uh, I, I didn't get the step from, from if the entropy is this linear combination that x is, uh, can you explain that step from this linear combination where you see that x should be this? There is a unique, well, uh, this is just a statement about numbers, that if I have two numbers, this uh, is uh, less than that and this lies in between, yeah. then I can write this number as a combination of. That's clear. Yeah, okay. The but the now the required properties of the entropy, they imply that this equation here for the entropies is equivalent to this equation here for the relation. Okay. Because we require that the entropy should characterize the relation. So this is equivalent to that. And now if you take, take another uh, uh, entropy which, uh, which uh, satisfies uh, uh, this here, then it leads uh, to the same equation, but now with lambda simply rela uh, relate, uh, re related by, by, by lambda prime. But uh, if, if you look at the assumptions A1 to A6, go through them, and, and uh, in particular this condition that you cannot go back, uh, you can see easily that this can hold for at least one, uh, for at most one lambda. So that is the uniqueness. Uh, 
and the existence was uh, was uh, was here, so to say, that these two numbers they coincide, and that is the that is the uh, yeah. This is, uh, this is nothing nothing uh, deep. Uh, no, my question was. I think what the wiggled a was the thing I was was uh, confused about. I think that was the point. Mm -hmm. The last step was clear again. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some physical systems where. You, you, you can read some physics papers where people are discussing whether the system or in which way the system satisfies the second law of thermodynamics, like this adiabatic piston, for example. I don't know if you... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, adiabatic piston. Yeah, yeah. Good, good point. That. <laughs> Does it give an easy way to sort of resolve these, these discussions in this axiomatic framework? Uh, well, of course, uh, writing down axioms will not resolve uh, such things, but... Uh, uh, yeah, that is a uh, what uh, what uh, so our conclusion. We discussed this also with Joel Leibovitz, and he was a great fan of the adiabatic piston. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, uh, our uh, state uh, way of thinking about this is that the, the, that there is no no uh, no unique. Uh, uh, equilibrium state. He would claim uh, uh, there is a unique equilibrium, uh, equilibrium state, but you have to wait very long, maybe to the, to the end of the universe. And then the, uh, the hammering of, of, of the atoms on, on its part of the piston will eventually lead to some definite result. But uh, yeah, so the adiabatic, so strictly speaking, the adiabatic piston does not fit into into our framework. That's a short answer, maybe. Any questions? Okay, Nicola. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Nicola. So, uh, as far as I understood, so you always say there is an equivalence. You would characterize entropy by saying it's equivalent. You can go from x to y, and the entropy increases. Yes. But can one, uh, in the non-equilibrium case, say at least that it's a necessary condition, that there exists an entropy, and it's necessary that the entropy increases without saying it's sufficient. Y yes, uh, well, yeah, now I have to <laughs> again to go back here. Uh, oops, non equilibrium. Yeah. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> well, if you, well, these, uh, well, the, the, these functions here, they have these properties that uh, they are monotone with respect to the relation. Mm -hmm. Both these functions and uh, any other function which has this monotonicity property with respect to the relation, it lies between these two. But, uh, uh, what you are, so to say, asking for is uh, whether whether they characterize uh, the relation, and that is uh, of only the case if they. So, so, this, so these are all equivalent here. You see, if you look at this e equivalent statement, what you are uh, saying was that uh, is point three, I guess. Yeah, you are asking if uh, there exists a necessarily unique extending S such that this implies that. Is that what you're asking for? Oh. Or about the, the other way? So there is just a unique as uh, existing as so such that this implies uh, that. I, I'm not, I think I'm not asking about uniqueness, but I would like to remove, I mean, is it possible to remove the five, uh, the fifth condition and get the, the Okay, well, uh, these are all equivalent. Yeah, but that you have a unique, you see, is it equivalent because you ask that it's unique? If I remove uniqueness in the second statement, for example. Um, yeah, well, <coughs> but, but that, um, I mean, uh, well, by three, that, 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 I mean, that is a, uh, a weaker s statement, and, 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 and that, so to say, if you have this here, and, and that is then necessarily unique, then uh, you, uh, you have that. So uh, this is equivalent to 
to that. You see, if there exists an S such that this holds, then, uh, then there exists a unique. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, we can. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let, there was one more question. If I remember well, somewhere. No. It's a, I mean, it's a very short one. Just from the very beginning, you had this clay at uh, the scaling property. I mean, you had also the state space could be scale to scale. Yes. Yeah. So what does what does that assume for the state space? I mean, you started with an abstract set. I was wondering what you have in mind there. Well. Uh, what we have in mind is, of course, <coughs> just that uh, if I have uh, uh, one liter of water here and uh, at uh, this uh, temperature and pressure, then I can have also two liters. So I am so, so taking the uh, so so the intuition behind this is that we <coughs> we have, so to say, the double amount, but with the same internal or or rather intensive. Uh, Parameters. I have not uh, defined that concept technically because we're not uh, needed. This is just for the purpose of interpretation. So, 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 so I mean, you kind of don't need the state space in a way to make it more concrete what it is at that point. Or no, one, one, one can't do uh, without, one can put all state spaces together into one, one shoot, or one can just talk about states. But this is, however, for this uh, more sophisticated part of the analysis, it's very uh, convenient to, to have them uh, neatly uh, put together into state spaces. But uh, this is, uh, scaling you, you will need in any case uh, some scaling. In fact, uh, in, 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 uh, in the uh, in the work of Robin Giles, which I mentioned, he never talks about such continuous scaling, but just about the doubling or tripling and, and not taking uh, pi times or something. <coughs> okay, so I propose that we any more questions, technical questions, we postpone and we can ask So let's thank again.